The session today will feature a very special format. It will first begin with an introduction, um, speaker, and then a discussion between the panelists. Our session will feature the UN's Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, Ms. Jayatma Vikramanayaka. How are you guys feeling this morning? Okay, do you have enough energy? Because I'm going to share with you some pretty dark statistics because we are doing a reality check. We live in a world that is so rapidly changing as was discussed many times yesterday. So my thesis today or my argument today is that this is the best of the times to be a young person but it is also one of the worst of the times to be a young person. Why is it the best of the times? We are the largest generation of young people in history. 1.8 billion between 18, 10 and 24, but half of the population if you take all of us who are under the age of 30. We are the most interconnected generation in the history of our world. We are also the most educated generation of young people in the history of our world. But it is also the worst of the times because we live in a world with huge challenges. More than 59 million young people as we speak are currently unemployed and over 136 million young workers are working, are employed, but still live in poverty. 15 million adolescents girls give birth every year while still being children themselves. Over 408 million young people live in areas affected by conflict or organized violence. 262 million young people between 6 to 17 years of age are out of school. Even though half of the world's population is under the age of 30, only 2% of the world's parliamentarians are under the age of 30. These are, of course, some of the many challenges that young people in the world face today. But of course, it is needless to say that for young people living with disabilities, young indigenous people, young women and girls, and young LGBTIQ people, these challenges are multiplied by one, two, three, four, many factors. We live in the worst of the times because in 2015, all UN member states got together and agreed on a common agenda for humanity, the Sustainable Development Goals. But four years down the line, despite progress in a number of areas, on some of the goals, progress has been incredibly so, or even reversed. The most vulnerable people and the most vulnerable countries continue to suffer the most, and the global response has not been ambitious enough. For instance, extreme poverty has reached the lowest point since its tracking began, and yet, at the current pace, we will not end poverty by 2030 in this world. Sometimes, it seems that the progress that has been made so far is being undermined by recent political developments and global trends. Climate change denial, the rolling back on human rights, particularly sexual and reproductive health rights of young women and girls, rise of nationalism, the lack of faith in multilateralism, the rise of extremism, the rise of violence, growing inequalities, and a prioritization of short-term political gains over long-term sustainability and well-being for people and the planet. All these dark stories but I still cannot help but be optimistic. Be optimistic when I see the commitment of millions of young people around the world. Those who might not have access to decision-making tables, those who might not have access to funding, platforms or resources, but wake up every day to run their own projects, to run their own initiatives, trying to bring a change in their own communities, in their own families, even in their own lives. For an example, young people like Greta Thunberg, a 16-year-old Swedish schoolgirl who started a protest in front of the Swedish parliament alone, and today 
she has mobilized millions of young people to take to the streets every Friday through a movement called Fridays for Future, now giving chills to many politicians and head of states around the world. Nadia Murad, a 26-year-old Nobel Peace Prize winning activist, one of the youngest with Malala Yousafzai to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. Nadia was held as a slave with other Yazidi girls and women by ISIS in Iraq. And today she uses her voice as a call to end sexual violence as a weapon of war and conflict. Emma Gonzalez, a 19-year-old high school student who was a shooting survivor, she's from the United States, along with other survivors of the school shooting incident in Parkland, Emma leads a national outcry for gun regulation in the United States through a movement called March for Our Lives. Ala Salah is a 22-year-old Sudanese student, and she was one of the protesters that came to the roads in millions to demand a democratic transition in Sudan, and she became the face of the Sudanese revolution. My friends, young people around the world are resisting, protesting, claiming their space. And there is a youth revolution unfolding in front of our eyes. Around the world, from north to south, east to west, Lebanon to Hong Kong, Iraq to Chile to France, we are seeing people, especially young people, coming together in new movements, demanding and instituting change. The fact that young people are not the leaders of tomorrow they are the leaders of today is not a marketing campaign. It is a fact, and these young people are the evidence to prove that fact. As the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, I have the privilege of experiencing firsthand how young people, especially young women and girls, are leading the way to achieve a sustainable, peaceful, gender equal world. I'm not sure how many of you noticed, but all the young leaders that I spoke about here, who are the faces of these mass mobilizations and revolutions, are young women and girls. Finally, after so many years, young women and girls are taking their rightful leadership, rightful place in driving social movements and in driving social progress. What I have observed over and over again from the refugee camps in Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh, to the camps in um, Zatari, Jordan. Young women and girls are the most vulnerable when it comes to crisis, but they're also the most resilient and the most resourceful. I am in awe of their resilience, their ability to mobilize and bring change in their communities. So to me, these stories are not just testimonies of amazing work that young people are doing to change the path for themselves, their communities, their countries, or to the planet. They point to something bigger, a fundamental shift in the way that young people weaves power today. A fundamental shift in the way today's young generation communicate and organize. These youth movements around the world demanding for peace, demanding for justice, equality, democratic transitions, women's rights, and climate change are made by young people who are volunteering their time, sacrificing their work in education, and sometimes even risking their lives. So the question that I want to ask all of you here today is what is the driving force behind these unprecedented mobilizations of young people that see, we see around the world? Is it increased awareness due to internet and social media that encourages young people to take a stand? Is it fair to ask young people to lead these struggles and pass on the batons without making sure that they have the right resources, tools, or sometimes even safe spaces to do so? These movements do not have governing councils or boards or constitutions or structures. So how do these young people organize themselves? How do they learn to be a part of a global movement that might have started 
in a different country, in a different continent, with a different group of people. How do they learn or what do they learn by being a part of a big mass movement like one of these? How do educational youth movements like the ones that you represent here in this room work together with these social movements? And what can you learn from each other? Are these mass mobilizations of young people going to continue? Or as some adults would say, is it just another phase in growing up? So the examples that I showed here are the faces of young people who have received a lot of media attention, who are out there on TV, on social media, and in the newspapers. But there are millions of other young people in their communities who do not get as much as recognition, but are driving change in their day-to-day -day work. I am very happy to share this stage next with a group of young people who are practicing what they are preaching and who are leading change in their organizations and in their communities. And I'm hoping that the answers to the questions that I pose to you could be answered by some of them. If not, at the end of this session, I will be opening up to the audience for you to contribute from your points of view. How do we answer some of these biggest realities or biggest questions that young people are asking all of us today. So let me welcome on stage my panel to continue this discussion. I have Julius Kramer. <laughs> Ehab Badwe. Ezequiel De Rosa is here. Karina Nanan. And Ellen Lindsay Avuka. Thank you very much for joining me on stage, please. So to kick off our discussion, I think it's best if we go to the audience and sort of see the reflections from those, who, those of you who have been listening to my rather long keynote speech. And what are the ideas that came to your minds when you were thinking about these different movements and engagement and leadership of young people? So we have on Slido a question for you to answer, which we will use as the baseline for this conversation to see how you're feeling and what you're feeling in one word as what is the biggest challenge that young people are facing today. You're already familiar. You can scan the QR code or go to the site and answer this question. Being trusted. Capacity. Money. <laughs> the biggest problem is it does. Mm -hmm. Very diverse answers. Exactly the same thing that came to my mind. About money. Opportunity, empowerment, adults being trusted, discrimination, empowerment, <laughs> recognition, underestimation. underestimation, support, opportunity. Mm. 
young people surprise me all the time. It's, these are definitely not the, not the uh, answers that I was expecting from, from all of you in the audience. But I think this, this, this leads to a very interesting discussion. Um, I have been trying to think, and a lot of people have been asking me this question, so I want to put it to you to see if you give a good answer, then I can adopt it and use it as well. Um, with these um, phrases and, and movements like, OK, Boomer, we are seeing sort of this um, approach where generations are sort of more divided and are becoming more confrontational. Whereas I believe that what we need to really work is across young people and adults and across generations and intergenerationally if we are to solve some of the biggest issues that we are facing in the world today. So I would like to get a very short reflection from each and every one of you as to how you see some of these um, challenges that our audience is telling us and how does some of that relate to your lives and the work that you are doing. So. I see now that the, the adults uh, went down. It's not as big <laughs> as it used to be. But Julius, would you like to touch up on that? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, is the microphone here? Yeah. Am I on? Yeah. OK. Um, no, it's, uh, this paints a, a pretty grim image, uh, I think, of, uh, uh, of how today's uh, youth generation is, is feeling. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes. I think it's yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, sorry. This paints a, a pretty grim image, and I think what strikes me is that uh, many of these are not uh, thematic issues. It's, it's not you're not pointing to climate or or poverty, but you're pointing to some of the very foundational issues that that give the conditions for all prosperity and all development in society, uh, all sustainable development goals, if you will. And I think uh, so. Uh, it it confirms some of the. Uh, trends that uh, that I think we're starting to see when you point into you know millions and millions of young people are taking to the streets um, and uh, and, uh, and uh, they're leading from the streets I, I was in Iraq just last week and and you can see how, how young people are in fact taking taking leadership uh, in society um, because they've previously been excluded uh, so uh, it, what I think what's interesting with with young people's engagement today uh, in countering these uh, many challenges is that it's extremely values driven and it's extremely principled and young people are getting power not from uh, not from formal political Tradition. power they're mm -hmm. being excluded mm -hmm. and they've been excluded for a very long time mm -hmm. uh, politically socially economically mm -hmm. but they're gaining power from their moral authority mm -hmm. young people uh, claim moral authority by being principled and being values driven uh, and I think uh, that's also uh, uh, where, where non-formal education comes into the picture. Yeah. Thank you, Julius. And I think it, it really leads the conversation to have the work that you are yes. doing. Uh, because you, you are a young refugee who is working on the Syrian peace process from, from Germany. And I know that you, as a young person who is trying to mobilize young Syrians living outside of Syria, face many of these challenges that uh, the, the audience have told us today when it comes to actually accessing those political institutions that Julius was mentioning and, and really getting in the, in, in the eyes of policymakers, what is that young people aspire? How does this resonate with you? Uh, like it's first of all, as young people, the young Syrian, we try to be part of the peace process. This is, it's like us to participate from we don't have capacity. We are not able to participate because we don't have the possibility to be part of the process. First of all, we don't have the knowledge help us to be part of this process. Also, like the platform where we can present our voice, how to communicate with member states, with United Nations. This is something doesn't support young people like us young people from Syria who are living in Syria, also uh, like young people as refugees to participate in this process. Uh, like. Access to non-formal education and to build capacity, it's somehow sometimes difficult to have knowledge built on mediation, for example. And also when we speak about young refugees living in camps like, Ira uh, like Lebanon, Turkey, like the possibility about have a new experience, new skills, to be able to be part of the new society, it's sometimes difficult because there is no possibility to learn something new because of the challenge young refugees live. Thank you, Hab. And 
Ezekiel, you have, um, you, I know yet that you have a very slightly different take on this because I know you don't like to talk about problems and you, you, <laughs> you call yourself a fixer and, and, and you, you, you find problems and you try to solve them and that is why I think at the age of 16 you became an entrepreneur. Yeah. So how does this reflect with the work you do and how as a young entrepreneur have you tried to tackle or break down some of these challenges and stereotypes? You know, uh, the biggest challenge that we have is the behavior and I need to agree with adults <laughs> uh, it's a huge challenge for young people because for example we work with a solution that saves water and when we talk about this to more old people than young people they don't care too much about the water etc I don't know it's not I know that's not only in Brazil this of course I'm doing a, in general of course but in Brazil, for example, if you talk with people with 60, 80 years, they don't care too much about the environment, etc. And if you go and talk with kids with 5, 10 years, they are much more conscious about the environment. So we are always in a transition process, of course, but the challenge that we have is to communicate to the old people or the adults, I could say, <laughs> that we can do something, we need to make this change happen, and we need to believe in young people as well, for example. So in our case, we go and we work with young people in the schools, etc., because we know that they are much more receptive about this. And with them, we develop uh, something to work together to engage older people to work on, on this yeah. challenge. You know? yeah. And also, I think it's important to note that when you say adults and young people, yeah. it's no way you're trying to. We're trying to generalize this. Yeah, there are sure. so many adults, and those of who you, those of you who are in this room, are actually supporters of young people. That is why you are <laughs> here, and, and we we really do appreciate that sort of intergenerational solidarity that that most of the adults in the world today are extending to young people. But also at the same time, not all young people are progressive as well, right? Yeah, so I think sure. a part of our conversation today should be that how do we mobilize across our generation yeah. as well to make sure that as a generation and as young people we actually talk to each other beyond our borders and beyond our silos and beyond our movements and really bring everyone together. Yeah. Did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. you know, I am, I am the older one here on the panel. <laughs> so uh, I really believe that it's not everybody, but uh, usually, for example, if we go and talk with my parents, the challenge is the same, so mm -hmm. that's why I think that we need to act together mm -hmm. to make the, some noise about what we want to do and what the change we want to have. Karina, mm -hmm. you were telling me about a very interesting experiment you did on Instagram where you were asking young people about different challenges, what their proposed solutions were. Um, what was that experience like? Were other young people comfortable sharing with you that in, in, uh, information? But also, what did you learn from that and how did you follow up on that? Yeah, um, well, basically, um, it was an Instagram story. You know, the young people, we love the social media. And um, basically, the story was directed to young people within Trinidad and Tobago, which I'm a proud citizen of. And, um, you know, we basically wanted to find and find solutions. What are the issues young people are facing? And most of them said the key components that came up were peer pressure. Parents telling them, you have to be a certain career, you have to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer, and it's not something they're very interested in, or that there aren't enough job opportunities for young people. And throughout that, it was such an open experience because they were able to share their most sincere, some of the most, you know, things that you would not expect a lot of young people to talk about. And, you know, a lot of people struggle with mental illness, depression, suicidal thoughts. It was overwhelming. And um, one of the ways how we were able to help, you know, find resources and solutions to those problems where we were able to connect them with local resources we had. Like, for instance, the persons that were suffering from anxiety, depression, we were able to put them onto our local health authorities for free counseling, free mental health. If they're in universities, we put them onto guidance counselors. For the people who, the young people who had problems with 
um, you know, like career choices, their parents. You know, we try to find nice little career guidance topics um, for them to share with their families and, you know, to try to encourage them. We already have a lot of doctors. We have a lot of engineers. It's kind of nice to have a psychologist in the room every now and again. It's kind of nice to have someone who's a tour guide, you know, and we try to tell them it's important to follow your passions because as a young person, the only thing that can really guide you, because we're going through endless change, I think all of us here can agree that we are not the same people we were yesterday. We're definitely not going to be the same people tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So it's, change is inevitable for the adults, the children, the older folks in the room. But um, it's really important that stability is there, because if you are guided by your passions, you can basically take it anywhere in life. So yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. And I think it's also a good reflection of how some of these challenges that we are referring to as young people might not be same or similar when it comes to young people living in different parts of the world, living different realities. Um, Ellen, if you ask the same question from your constituency back home, would you expect the same answers or in your conversations, what have young people in your movement and in your country have sort of prioritized as, as um, their key issues to tackle within the coming years? Okay, so I think that it, it is pretty much the same things because uh, I think that there are fundamental challenges that young people all over the world face. And the basic one for my country is uh, trust. Young people are not trusted and uh, there is like a culture where young people are assumed to have like um, not much experience and not much knowledge on anything so if a young person wants to talk about anything if a young person has an idea about anything that would change society by the mere fact that the person is young that is not going to be listened to and so young people face the challenge of having their voice heard this also resonates in when it comes to employment by the matter that you are young, it is very difficult to have any source of employment. Mm. And even when you do... Okay. And even when you do, as a young person, there are two things. is Either you are going to be like overutilized for less salaries or less uh, pay, or, or that you are, you are really not... Uh, you are really not seen as someone who has the cap capabilities to solve the challenges of, of the job that you are offered. So young people face all this problem and also of poverty because if you ha don't have a job that's like a stable job, then you also don't have money. And so young people are poor and they, they can't even fend for themselves. So I think this resonates everywhere across the globe. I just want to pick up on the, the issue of trust that you underlined as the fundamental uh, issue that is across the generation, yeah. doesn't matter where you come from. And Ehab, I want to go to you with that question. Yeah. In, when we did um, this global survey or the global study on youth peace and security, we were consulting young people who have been part of violent groups or former combatants or young people who were attracted to extremist groups to ask what really did inspire them or motivate to join these different groups. Um, many of us thought that the answers are going to be education or employment or like a single issue that it disempowered them that attracted them to these different movements. But the answer was different. There were two key underlying issues that young people identified as were pull factors or push factors rather to, to join these movements. And that was one was the exclusion from making decisions about their lives, about their bodies, about their families, about their countries. And two was the lack of trust, lack of trust in political institutions. Young people who were attracted to these movements did not believe that they could trust institutions to serve them well. How do you tackle with these issues when you are working to mobilize young people for the cause of peace, especially in terms of bringing young people who have already lost trust, who have already lost faith, into a conversation about peace, into a conversation with institutions, with different partners, with different parties of a conflict? What are some of your strategies and tactics? Yeah. And 
And to start from begin in 2016, after the World Humanitarian Summit and Youth Forum, we come with the idea together as young Syrian about we need to find a platform able to present us and also to present the rest of young Syrian living in Syria or in Europe. Like the first point to communicate with the young people, to have attention of young people about what we are doing and what we need to do later, it was like you need to check the needed of young people in the field to take attention on and then to have this group of young people and to go together to the peace process. We start to take care about education, about development, about access to labor market, about giving skills to be able to find job. Here we start to think about we need to find different program of education can give young people the possibility to learn, have more capacity, more skills, more and then to move together with them to the peace process. And the next step when we start to have the big network of young people, until we achieve right now about 50,000 young people in one network, after two, 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 three years from 2016, we, we find ourselves now we are able to go together with the young people to, the, to Geneva, to the peace process, to say, look, we are a group of young people, look to have peace, educated, we have the capacity and we are able to participate in the peace process. With a lot of support from your side, from other side, we find the possibility to be part of the peace process, to be, if not inside the room, around the room. We have the different rule, we have different tools we can use in our hand to have, to make the decision and use participation. What is the role of non-formal education being in order for you to leave an organization and a mo lead a movement and an organization like this? And, and how, how do you think we can use non-formal education as a tool to empower young people to trust in peace, to believe in peace, and to engage in peace building? The first point about the capacity building to access it online and to give it more able for many young people living inside Syria, as non-formal education, it's more easy to have it as formal education in Syria, for example. Other, other example, for example, to empower young women inside Syria and give them the possibility to learn as well, it's more possible with non-formal education. Like, Think us about to understand how we can communicate together, to have this dialogue, to, ha to, spe to, be, to speak about this conflict. It's more possible with non-formal education than formal education. The way how non-formal education pre presented it, it's more equal for everyone. To to, and also, it gi give us the, op the opportunity to learn some, something touch us, not something it's formal like this. And this is more right. practical and flexible for us as young people right. to, to be part of it. Yes. And also if there's this other um, practitioners in the audience who are working <coughs> on non-formal education for peace building, we would really love to hear this perspective from mm. you when we open up the floor later. Um, Julius, I sometimes have this identity crisis where oh. in the morning I have to dress up <laughs> and go to the UN, <laughs> try to be a UN official, but also on Friday, sneak out, join the protests that are happening, um, and kind of trying to really live my life as a young person, yeah. but also to be able to be within an institution yeah. who can facilitate that engagement, who can bring those voices in. Um, and I know that you wear many hats as well, as, uh, as a member of the steering committee of WASM, um, as, as, as a um, Swedish government official, uh, but also dif in different youth movements. How, how, do we, how do we manage this? How do we make sure that there are links, for an example, the protests that are happening in Iraq that you witnessed just last week, to the work that the scouts are doing through non-formal education. No. How do we bring social movements that are happening outside on the streets into the same rooms, into the same conversations with educational youth movements like the scouts? Wow, that, I mean, uh, and that's... It's a million dollar question. Yeah, that is the million dollar <laughs> question. And I think, uh, uh, I, I want to start with addressing an, uh, sort of what I think is a, a a constant elephant in the room, and that's that, um, and, and you touched on it, uh, several of you, that uh, elected, elected officials are, are uh, not very good at the, doing their jobs, uh, and, uh, and young people are not having it. Simple. It's quite, <laughs> it, it, it is quite simple, you know, and we, we uh, and I think one, one thing that non-formal education does is that, I mean, uh, scouting is a, a democratic movement, uh, and we're a, a youth-led movement in the sense that we have millions of, of local patrol leaders around the world. Uh, that, uh, that learn leadership and learn democratic and inclusive leadership. So that's one way that non-formal education shapes young people 
of course, too. But I think uh, the million dollar question is, of course, how does how do uh, the scouting and, and guiding and, and these uh, long uh, sustained social movements tap into the the uh, activism that we see from young people now because they're not having it, that governments are, are not doing, uh, doing their job very well. Um, and, uh, um, and I think that one important aspect of that is uh, addressing the trust deficit that we're talking about. You know, um, uh, trust deficit is, is largely a result of inequalities. And the UNDP, UN Development Program, re released their human development report just the other day uh, talking about how, uh, I mean, whilst millions of people still lack access to the most basic of needs, we're still getting better at addressing that. What we're not very good at addressing is the next level of needs. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the needs uh, uh, that uh, exacerbate inequalities, uh, th those needs that will be important for the future, which mm -hmm. is access to digital tools, uh, uh, internet, access to skills, values that, that go beyond the formal educational system. So we need to adjust to that and we need to understand how to address that. And, and become more inclusive. Uh, and uh, uh, I think what non-formal education does, such as scouting and guiding and, and, and these other movements, is that we, we uh, uh, address this trust deficit very systematically. Scouting is an intergenerational movement, so while we're led by young pat patrol leaders, uh, we're also yet led by scout leaders uh, who, who are ad adults. Uh, and, uh, and I think that intergenerational uh, trust builder, I think, is a very important one. That's, ve that's very interesting, and we'll come back to that, but you touched upon inequality as a driving force for the trust deficit, and I know that, Ellen, in your work from the Socialist Education International, you try to bridge inequalities, and you try to educate young people through non-formal education on inequalities. What has that experience li been like, and also, how do you practically do it? Okay, so basically, uh, inequalities is really rising at a a very tremendous level, parallel to the gap between the rich and the poor. And, and this sad fact also is that uh, the large portion of the world's wealth is placed at the very topmost uh, of the income spectrum. And so young people are faced with the challenges of, of uh, today and future prospects. And they are also the ones that are faced with uh, the challenges, the economic and social challenges today. Um, the also another sad part is that all of the global problems that we have currently, like climate change uh, and like poverty, even the SDGs, are really going to be solved by young people. But the problem is that young people are not able or are not given the opportunity to participate in political discourses and to be part of making decisions. Another issue is that young people are treated as a homogeneous group. But then young people are like different people and some people face more inequalities than others based on their religion, their race, etc. And so it is very important to target young people specifically based on all these different aspects and to address their needs accordingly. Now, uh, we have also realized that most of the issues that are resulting in the inequalities is based on policies, social norms and behaviors and cultures that are actually resulting in all of this. And so in order to tackle that, then we must tackle the norms and behaviors that are leading to this. What Socialist Education or IFM SCI, which is my organization, what we do is that we empower young people to, to know their rights and to, uh, to challenge the inequalities in the world but we do this based on the principle of respect, based, sorry, based on the principle of respect, equality, and also on friendship. Because we believe that these three key things are those that will help to challenge the, the norms that are bringing inequality. If we have friendship and solidarity, when you are acting in any way you consider, how does this affect people globally? Even when you act locally, you have to think like a global citizen, and then you have to have some kind of compassion and solidarity towards others that are not immediately in your community. That, that, that brings me into a very, very interesting conversation, particularly on climate change. Yeah. I think one of the biggest issues of the youth movement today is climate change, and young people are organizing around the issue. The thing about climate change and the inequality about climate change is that communities who are affected by climate change are not actually the ones who created it, right? 
young people in the Caribbean are particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change. But the behavioral changes that um, Ellen was mentioning, for an example, excessive consumption and production um, <laughs> leads to a lot of these conversations on climate change. How do you, Karina, as uh, a young person from uh, the Caribbean interact and organize with other young people from your region to educate young people about living eco-friendly lives, being environmental friendly, but at the same time also advocate for um, climate action. So um, basically, we know the Caribbean surrounded by so much beautiful water. Um, you know, when you think about the Caribbean, you just think about paradise. It's everything you want to be at probably right now, but you're here, <laughs> so sorry. But um, basically, you know, with climate change, it's the Caribbean of all people will feel it the most because we are talking about high sea levels will rise. It will be due to coastal erosion then things as beautiful as our reefs will be damaged. We're talking about billions of dollars will be lost because almost every island or country in the Caribbean is solely relying on tourism as their source of income. And you're going to see tremendous drops in tourism for our hotels, from our everyday life on tourism boards, from just the very small people that probably have a little fishing boat that will take you out to a different island, the, even the smaller guys who are just operating very small businesses. So in that aspect, it's going to greatly impact all of the Caribbean islands and countries. What we've been seeing happening across, not just with young people, but we are trying to see that citizen government organizations and agencies across the globe in the Caribbean are trying to make stance in terms of what can we do because we are the major people that are going to feel this the most. The in Tr Trinidad and Tobago, we signed in the COP in Paris, Congress of Parties, over in 2016. We are majorly an oil producing society based on our economy. We have been solely relying on oil and gas production for quite some time, but we're realizing the impact it's going to be making. So we've signed an agreement as we contribute to 1% of the carbon emissions. So our carbon footprint is pretty big for a population of just 1.8 mm -hmm. million people. So what we're trying to do is September 21st, along with, I believe, a lot of countries around the world, we joined in coastal cleanup. We're seeing a lot of youth organizations as well stepping up with um, recyclable initiatives from simple things as just cons conservation in like water, from as simple as instead of just using paper and plastic and just dumping it, we're trying to create more recycling initiatives. So it's very small steps, even though we have a lot more to go and we have a lot more to do and see, we would really like to make sure that our islands stay at the forefront and be protected. So yeah. Thank you, Karina. I'm going to go to Ezequiel for one last question, but I just want to give you a heads up. After Ezequiel, I'm going to be opening up for an interactive session with the audience. So already start thinking about what you want to share. Um, also, if you have any questions for the panelists, feel free to share. But what we're really looking to is to engage in a conversation and a dialogue and your perspective on, on what these young leaders have shared. So Ezequiel. Um, compared to the other four young leaders on this panel, I think one of the one of the things is one you do not identify yourself with a youth movement or, or, or a youth organization. You are a young entrepreneur, so I'm interested in knowing what kind of a role did non-formal education play for you to become a, a young entrepreneur at a very young age of 16. But secondly, I think your story is worth hearing. The, the, the name of the business that Ezequiel runs is PP. <laughs> so it's basically about P. And I think it's very interesting to hear how someone can make money out of P. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I have a question. Who P today? <laughs> <laughs> or not? And who flush it? <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for the question. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the question. It's just explain quickly about our uh, startup. Uh, I have developed a solution that can work on P, and the purpose is to save water in toilets and urinals. Uh, basically, up to 40% of the water that we treat in the world is used by flushes. So this is a huge challenge that, that we have. And when I knew all these big numbers, I decided to do something. And about the non-formal education, in my case, for example, I could say that almost everything comes from non-formal education because 
as I started too early, I, uh, the best school that I had was the, my life, <laughs> doing so something. So basically, let me, let me recap. So you didn't really learn about running a business in school? No. Or innovation no. in school? No, no. I, for example, uh, I have a degree in international business. Mm -hmm. And even when I conclude my degree, the university doesn't have like an entrepreneur, uh, you know, uh, listen, etc. So right now they have startups, they have incubators, etc. But like in my case was 2013. This is almost like just a green area about nothing. <laughs> so the challenge was okay. I have, I want to do something, and I need to learn how to do it. So that's why I am very proud about the history and the journey that we have been doing all these years. Like for example, I am working with PP. It's about nine years. As I said, I am 31 today. So, I, and, and in Brazil especially, for example, yeah, probably you saw about the PISA report uh, two weeks ago, something, one week ago. In Brazil, 2% of students doesn't know the difference between a fact or an opinion. So, you know, it's pretty hard if you just depend on the formal education to do something. So, Brazilian people are very creative, we, we like to do many things at the same time, you know, I think that we are very happy people that we, even with a lot of problems, we always try to find a solution that is simple and quickly to solve the problem. So basically it's in our culture to do something like this, but I know that it's not only in the Brazilian culture that this happens. So for non-formal education, in my special opinion, it's impressive how many change that can make in young people, you know. Thank you very much, Isikwa. So with that, I'm going to open the floor. So if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, or even ideas and perspectives that you would like to share, please raise your hand, and one of the volunteers will bring you a microphone. So we have three hands going up here. Over here, yes. Thank you. Um, one question that I feel has been missing a bit um, in the discussions is about the businesses. So I feel like we haven't been really focused on the discussions about businesses and how we involve them, because we see the huge shift in the businesses, how they're running now, you know, leaving this kind of uh, business for profit model and moving more towards the ESG. So they're putting that in the center. So what is kind of your pers perspective on this? how do we get involved in the conversations because they're the ones who have the money obviously right, right? they have the influence that we need um, but we have the expertise so why don't we kind of bridge that gap and mm. work more collaboratively i'll take three questions or comments and then i'll come to you but i'm also giving you time to formulate your answers um anna uh, sorry tina and fabio yeah So yeah, in the light of today's uh, Human Rights Day, I would like Can to... Can I also kindly ask you to introduce yourself? Oh, Sorry, I forgot yeah. to do that with you. So yeah, hi, I'm Tina Hochevar from the European Youth Forum. So yeah, today it's a Human Rights Day, so I would actually like to draw attention also to the fact that it's not the needs that we have, but these are our rights. rights. It's not mm -hmm. the need to have a job, but it's our rights to have a job. And there are many, I mean, young people are facing many, many uh, challenges in this regard. For example, age-based discrimination is still very present. One example is that we are doing, for example, the same kind of job, but we are getting paid less just mm -hmm. by the fact that we are younger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so these are discriminations that we are facing. And uh, then I would also have a question for the panelists. How are you including the rights-based approach into your own uh, advocacy work? Great. Thank you very Thank much, you. Tina. Thank you. My name is Fabio Frischia from UNICEF. Um, I was reflecting on this very interesting conversation um, and I felt very scared. I think the situation is, is very grim. Um, two things that have been mentioned in this conversation, climate change. Um, we've been discussing about the Caribbeans and the water. Uh, unfortunately, I think that uh, is climate change is not going to come only as water, it's going to come as social disruption, it's mm -hmm. going to be very painful, it's going to be very nasty. 
Uh, and the other thing we'll be talking about extremism, the study you mentioned. Um, I've been witnessing myself how social media can be extremely vicious in turning public opinion in a few months in the wrong direction. I saw that happening in Italy, um, where in Brazil also where the situation went somehow um, funny. Um, and I was wondering what are the, the, the forces that are against us are extraordinary. And I was wondering what are the forces that, that we have uh, on our side. And I think that the result of the study you were mentioning actually gives us a very important direction identity mm -hmm. uh, and belonging to a group, sense of belonging to a group, are, I think, the most powerful forces that we have. And I'm very happy of being here with the scouts, because I think that nobody better than them is able to instill in young people this, this very important value. Um, it doesn't cost anything, um, it, but it needs the right expertise, which I think is, is in this room is this with, with these participants. So I think that we should include this as priorities in our non-formal education system because I believe that identity and sense of belonging are two very important cards that we can play against these powerful forces that are against us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Who would like to respond? Okay, so I will take on Fabio <laughs> from <laughs> UNICEF. Um, pleasure again. Um, so yes, he did also mention about the impacts, for the, the social impacts that uh, climate change is about to make, and it's very important that we reiterate that, not just the oceans, which are very important as well, but we saw this just this year with Hurricane Dorian that affected the Bahamas. Um, we saw, I think it was an estimated $8.7 billion reported in damages. It was estimated about 61 persons were affected and seven people were like injured or died along the way. So with that, it's going to be, you know, as he said, it's, it's very, very, very tremendously going to affect people, their social lives, because... You, you also saw what this happened with Hurricane Maria and Irma in 2017. Not just the Bahamas was affected, but you had countries such as Puerto Rico, Cuba, some parts of Jamaica. So it's important, again, that we reiterate the importance of climate change for the biomarine diversity as well as social life that's going to mm -hmm. affect a lot of people. So I hope that clarifies for Fabio. Yes. And, and I think it's also important to mention, and I think UNICEF is working on this extensively, the increased mental health issues among young people and adolescents because of climate change and anxiety um, and also the, uh, the, the distress that uh, extreme climate events or disasters could cause on young people. So I think we need to have all of this in mind um, without trying to silo it into, into single issues. But Julius, would you be um, interested in taking up the question on, on, on rights? Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> um, it, it's uh, no, it's uh, such a good point. I mean, uh, if we uh, and I think it's easy to forget about rights when we start talking about the SDGs and and uh, uh, the SDGs uh, is such an um, effectiveness agenda. You know, we want to do things better. We want to uh, raise the level of ambition. Uh, uh, but we need to realize that it's not only about development, it's the de development for the sake of humans and uh, people and planet, uh, so to say. So if we, if we keep, and I think the same goes for why we want to involve young people, why young, people, uh, um, why young people's participation is important, uh, not only using the instrumental argument of young people have important opinions, young people uh, are good at this, which are extremely valid arguments and, and of course uh, important ones as well, but also that young people have the right to be part of that conversation and young people uh, have the right to participate. So I think that's, and, and to that point, I think when we talk about extremism, it's extremely important to to uh, emphasize that, uh, of course, most young people are uh, not uh, extremists, and most young people uh, do not take part in violent conflict, and most young people uh, are either positive agents of change or just want to get on with their lives. Uh, and uh, and I think uh, the way uh, the the point about identity and 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 belonging is is important, and and resilience building, you know. Uh, which is uh, which is just what what scouting does. We contribute to this social glue, uh, the social fabric of a society that, uh, uh, and I think we need to give ourselves more credit for that. But it's also very difficult to measure resilience, uh, and and to what extent we uh, we contribute to that. Um, yeah. 
Ezekiel and Anna Ellen, would you like to? I'm going to follow yeah, up on that identity point. Like my personal experience with Scout, when I arrived in Germany, the first thing I asked about to join a Scout, because I feel I belong to those people, I belong to this group, I find my identity with Scout. Because when I find my, myself in one family, very big family, people care about you, people care about your integration in this country, about easier to, way to learn the language, easier way to understand the community, you belong. You belong to this community, you belong to, to this identity. And I feel as well like it's difficult as well, me personally, someone uh, refused to leave the country, to be a refugee. It's not my choice. Mm. I didn't choose to do this. Like seven years now without family, it's very difficult. It's very painful. But you don't have any way. You need to belong to someone. It's good to belong to Scout. And this is something Scout really put on me. And no, I think that that's I think that's a very strong message, and I think you know we are very lucky to have you with us here. Uh, but I think there's also millions of other young people who do not have that opportunity and who do not have that access. And I really encourage you, as youth movements and, and youth organisations, to also to, to be inspired by stories like this and try to reach out to young people who might otherwise not be included in your organisations, like young refugees, young migrants, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, Ezekiel, would you like to take? The question on the businesses yeah. um, and maybe Ellen you can chip in yeah. as well. Can you just repeat the question because uh, what exactly can businesses do more in no. yeah. yeah sorry so the businesses are moving away from the business for profit model and moving more towards putting the ESR in their agendas, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So And they have the money, they have the influence, but we are not partnering up with them. Why is that and how can we leverage? Because we have the expertise. Yeah. They're only starting now to put this into focus. It's mostly because of, you know, millennials. If they want to attract the talent, retain the talent, they need to kind of sell themselves as a socially responsible corporations and so on. But we're not leveraging on it, so you know is it's it a huge opportunity. Yes. Um, and how do we leverage? Well, because you yeah. are in the business community, is yeah. it because that we are not reaching out to businesses, or is it because businesses don't want to work, work with social movements? No, I, I think that the challenge is always the behavior, and when we are talking about behavior, we are talking about people, and the challenge is all these big companies. They want to make money. They want to show some good results to the investors. And the challenge they face is usually the eco-friendly solutions, more sustainable solutions are more expensive than the traditional one. So the challenge that they have is, okay, how to show to our investors that we can go green, we can go more eco-friendly and making money with this. And that's why I believe too much in technology because I think that the challenge that we have as entrepreneurs is to use the technology to accelerate this process, you know, this changing. Because if we need to wait, the people change their behavior or their mindset, this will take decades, you know, <laughs> it's too much time to make this change happen. So that's why I believe that the technology, we need to use the technology to make this process more quickly. And these large companies, they need to invest in solutions that, okay, the market really want to buy these kind of solutions. But this solution is still more eco-friendly. Just for example, in my case, if you put my solution, it's very cheap, and you still saving a lot of water instead of using like a traditional toilet. So if you go to electrical cars or something like this, uh, or even in Brazil, for example, we have in the US the Impossible Foods. In Brazil, we have uh, a very new brand about this too. And my wife, for example, she didn't eat in any, any kind of natural products, something like this, organic products, etc. But she started to eat this kind of food just because the taste is very, very similar to the traditional one. So the challenge that, I, that all these big companies have is, okay, how, how can I produce my product in a more eco-friendly, making less impact in the envir environment, etc., and keep my sales growing up? So in my point of view, the challenge is how to use this, all this technology that we have Usually, I like to say we have technology, we have intelligence, well, our cars are self-driven, but we still pee in clean water. <laughs> so that's why I think that we need to make all these big companies understand they can be more sustainable and make money at the same time just using technology. 
I want as well to add one point, like from our experience as non-profit organization, as young people organization try to work on youth empowerment, like as well we don't have money. It's mm. difficult to have funding to work on this issue, yeah. but like technology help us to access many platform with non traditional way to support thousands of young people with less cost. Mm -hmm. And this is also very nice to, to use technology about as like non profit organization have no funding to do impact mm -hmm. equal like the impact we do when we do it in traditional way with a lot of money. And I think using so. technology. Yeah. In my opinion, it's impossible to create impact without money, yeah. you know, and the challenge that we face is to make the market, the traditional market, believe in us, you know. And, and I, I would argue, for an example, sustainability, for an example, has to be embedded in the business model mm -hmm. of the company. I mean, I've seen fossil fuel companies run advertisements on recycling. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, so uh, I think it has to go beyond CSR or social projects to really transform the business models yeah. and, and make sure that sustainability is embedded in the business, but not just a tick in the box and an add-on to a business. Uh -huh. Ellen, how do you use uh, non-formal education, or how can we use non-formal education to educate young people as consumers? But also, it's young people who work for these companies. How can we get? Uh, people who are working for these organizations and companies to also start uh, instigating that change from within the private sector. Okay, so I want to start from this way. Uh, I'm not so good with statistics, but I hope I'm correct. So I know that with the SDGs, there's an annual gap of $2.5 trillion each year uh, if we really must attain the SDGs. The problem here is that we can't have this money, the money is nowhere that we are going to take. It really, most of it must come from the private sector. And uh, this can only happen through partnership, and this can also only happen when the private sector is more aware of the, the importance of sustainability. Uh, through non-formal education, we are able to like, teach or empower young people working in these private sectors on the importance of uh, adapting sustainability in everything that they do even to the extent of like trying to talk to their um, uh, production liners, to their management, try to make them understand the concept of sustainability and how important this is to, to um, help in development. So by this way, through the non-formal education, this can be uh, achieved and the uh, gap in the um, the gap in finances. I think I, I keep on always like talking so loud. <laughs> yeah. And so through this way, then we are able to like bridge the gap of finances that we have. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I'm now going to the audience again for another round of questions. I have Richard. I need some people from that side to speak out. It's just only this side. Richard, um, can we get the microphone here, please? And then over there. There, and then number three. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Chair Atma, and thank you to the panelists. I just want to pick it up from where Tina stopped earlier. I'm Richard, I'm from International Young Catholic Students, and I'm here representing ICMIO, which is the International <coughs> Coordination of Youth Organizations. Uh, I'm, I'm so interested in the question of youth policies and youth development issues. I think that in many countries uh, that already develop uh, uh, youth policies, it's based on youth needs rather than youth rights, uh, like uh, um, Tina just said. And I think as long as we continue to remain on what young people need rather than the rights that they have, we will not be able to achieve uh, uh, meaningful youth development. And when we keep the issue about, uh, you know, like <laughs> UNICEF is just right beside me, uh, 30, 30 years ago, children started having rights and and after they become adult or they cross from childhood to the adult threshold, they no longer have rights. And so I think it's a very sad thing to see that you have a right as a child and then you become an adult or a young adult and the rights disappear. And we begin to talk of needs and you begin to be discriminated against. And I, I think when we talk about youth development issue, it has to focus very specifically on the rights that young people have and how we can assure those rights. In terms of participation, we have also seen that many government or governmental institutions or even private entity businesses try to use the divide and rule approach that they try to create a kind of clique of young people and how to separate them for their own interests. And so 
uh, you, you kind of destroy all the structures that support cooperation between young people to be able to build a transform or better society for themselves. So you have young people who are supporting different ideas, not because they want to build a better society, but because they want to promote the idea of setting interest, vested interests within government, within private institutions. And I think we as young people need to realize this fact and know that our cooperation is essential to build the world that we want. And if adults, are, they said they are the issues, I don't think they are the main issue because I think intergenerational dialogue is very essential to build the world that we need. But in order to do this, young people must also be able to dialogue with themselves to cooperate so that we can effectively cooperate with the adult. And adults should stop the idea of dividing and ruling us, but give us that platform to cooperate, to bring our own idea as uh, young people. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Richard. Yes. Can Thank we have you. a mic? Good morning. Over th um, it's OK. Oh, my sorry. I was actually referring to the young lady in the back. But it's OK. You go first, and then I can give. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My name is Maru. I'm from Eidos Global from Argentina. And I think I want to re revisit what you mentioned about the lack of youth participation in decision-making processes. We are nowadays um, seeing a lot of focus put on, on youth and a lot of people are talking about uh, young people. But, and, and we talked about this uh, yesterday during lunch with some people, there's a view that young people are protesting, maybe expressing their needs, but that they don't bring any solutions to the table when in reality the issue is that we don't have as many spaces in the decision-making table and a seat, a permanent seat, as we should. So my question to you, and maybe you can address is, what do you think young people bring to the table? Why is it so important that we participate in the design of our own futures? Very good question. Hi, uh, my name is Gloria. I come from uh, Bolivia. I am working at the regional office of Latin America and the Caribbean at UN Environment. And I want to thank you all for this uh, amazing panel. I was uh, very thrilled to hear all the solutions that you are uh, throwing uh, towards uh, climate action. And I was wondering, uh, I, I really much appreciate the comment of the how we can improve uh, sustainable production and how we can encourage business to do it uh, to do what we wanted to be doing right now but I wanted to highlight the power that as consumers we have and, how, and I was wondering uh, and I would like to ask um, all of you how would sustainable how we can uh, how we can work towards sustainable production how we can work toward a more sustainable path what is the power of youth how we can encourage more uh, habits and a sustainable path. Great, yes. thank you very thank you. much. And this round I will take four questions because there's one additional question uh, behind the camera. Good morning. Uh, my name is Clark Truscott. I lead the SCAD Association of New Zealand. Uh, my question, I start with a reflection. Um, about a month ago, uh, a, young parliamentarian, a young parliamentarian in New Zealand was interrupted um, during a speech on the importance of climate change, and um, she kind of turned to the parliamentarian who interrupted her and sort of said, OK, boomer, um, and moved on. Uh, now, what happened in New Zealand society over the following couple of weeks was a, what I observed was quite a cynical and severe backlash against young people. Um, and it caused me to, um, listening to your panel, reflect on that and think about what's the role of intergenerational partnership um, in what we're talking about and um, uh, what's the, um, the responsibility of young people and older generations to own the need for intergenerational partnership um, and, and what thoughts you have on uh, how we might advance that agenda. Because um, I, I just feel right now it's very easy to play the blame game. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Who would like to go first? I'm going to speak about the one of youth representative as ha why we need to be as young people part of decision making. Like to come through the, the Syrian peace process. Why we ask about youth participation in this peace process. It's our future. If we are not able to be part of this future, it will be dark future. Anything need to be 
designed for us in the future and we don't have any participation in this future, it's not going to be on us. That's all. We need to have the right to participate in making this decision. If not on the table, it's around the table. If not around the table, inside the room. If not inside the room, around the room. There is many different levels to participate in this peace process, but we are not going to give up to say, no, we are cannot participate. There is many different tools help us to be part of this. We try to present the voice of young people from field. We try to present the right of young people, not the needed, because the right, this is, it's our right. It's not something we ask about like gift. It's very important to be part of this process because we shape this future by our hand. Um, so I would like to just comment on, um, you know, there are four, we got four questions just now and they were all sort of interrelated. So I want to touch first on Richard about youth development because Richard also goes hand in hand with New Zealand about intergenerational partnerships. So let's touch on both of that at the same time. Um, I think one of the key factors on how we can get intergenerational partnerships is trying to emphasize the importance of the youth being the future of tomorrow. That if you do not listen to them now, when, how are you going to make sure that you are trusting them with the world in, our, in their hands, you know? And it's important that we also bring business models of social entrepreneurship. Um, I think uh, we would probably touch on that during this panel. Basically, if we help encourage organizations, companies, and maybe government places to adapt social entrepreneurship, we can get more of the SDGs targets completed. We can make a better significant change with climate change because we are able to know that in all, we are responsible for the future we are going to live in now. So I hope that touches on intergenerational partnerships. Um, Marie, also you spoke about a lack of youth participation and what do you think young people can bring to the table? So, you know, I just want to add this in. We really need to, there needs to be a common theme of respect from both parties, you know, from the adults, the young people. And um, what we are gearing towards being a better future because now, look at us in the room. We have a lot of young people who care about social issues. So, you know, I don't think that's going to be so much of an issue. The problem that we'll have to do is make sure there's a common theme of respect. And young people do bring a lot to the table because even if we don't have the voice to make decisions on a, like legislation or parliament, we make little changes based on social media. We could do silent protests. We do viral challenges. You know, those are little things that are going very far. And just to touch on the contribution made by our Bolivia representative, um, how do we work towards a more sustainable path? It's about incorporating everything that I just would have said, the partnership with the intergenerational themes, and we will, you know, be able to make a more better future based on working together and having mutual respect. So, yeah. And I think about this, it's uh, we need to stop to buy products that companies that are not sustainable. Correct. You know, uh, everything that we put money, this becomes more developed. It's the same for any kind of market. It's the same for sustainable companies, etc. So imagine if everybody here starts to buy only products for sustainable companies mm -hmm. or companies that are more responsible about their results, etc. Probably in ten years we will have a different world. Correct. Yeah, we, 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 sorry. <laughs> we would have seen this with the very simple thing about hairsprays. Remember when we, we found out that the ozone layer was being totally destroyed? Uh -huh. We totally banned CFCs. Yeah, sure. And look at it now, there's not a product on market with CFC. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You just need to stop to buy this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to speak on what do young people bring to the table. Young people are highly innovative. Young people are highly skilled. And in spite of all the systemic um, like restrictions on young people, there's a proven record of young people leading lots of political movements, mm -hmm. leading lots of changes in society. And if you look at the trends of, of um, that society is going, the technological advancement, you realize that 
it needs a lot of uh, technological know-how to, to solve the problems of this 21st century, but realize that young people are more inclined technologically, young people are more like used to the internet, so it is young people that are actually equipped with all the knowledge and the skills that are needed to solve the challenges of the 21st century. So this is what young people bring to the table. We, we have all the skills, we have all the innovation, we have all the knowledge. We, we got it all to, to make the change that we want and to deal with the challenges that we have. I think very, very interesting questions, but I also think very, very interesting and strong responses, particularly on the issue of, of intergenerational dialogue. And again, this is something that I've been hearing a lot from the youth groups that I work with. And, and you, you said it very well, Karina. Um, it's easy to get into an intergenerational dialogue, but young people to be always looked at as if you are adults in training, so that you're always talked at, not talked with. So if there is intergenerational dialogue, I think the, the key principle should be there should be mutual respect across generations, within generations, and you really have to acknowledge young people at the table or around the table, as a hub says, as, as, as agents of change, they, they have to be identified for their agency um, as, as full individuals, not as, not as adults in training. But uh, Julius, do you have anything to add? What is it so special that young people bring to the table that, that perhaps others cannot? What? I'm not. Ooh. I have nothing to add to the point about what young people bring to the table. I, I just think we need to be cautious about expecting young people to bring the solutions because there's, there's a time to, uh, to, uh, to rely on young people to hold decision makers accountable. Uh, and of course, there's also a time to rely on young people's expertise and perspectives, which might sometimes bring solutions or part of the solution. But I think we need to expect, we need to be able to, sorry, Paul, thank you. We need to be able to expect from our uh, elected officials that, uh, I mean, we, if we live in a representative democracy, that they uh, are qualified to make decisions that take into account the needs of the population. And that's also, I want to add, a reason to why young people should be included, except the most important one, which is the right, rights-based one, but the demographic one. And this is an easy one to sell to decision makers. Mm -hmm. If you ignore a majority of your population, I mean, that's just stupid. Um, and. Uh, when it comes to the, the point about intergenerational uh, partnerships and the, the backlash, young people have been at the forefront of social development always. And there's always been a tension between young people and uh, the status quo. And I don't want to say adults because many of the young people driving this change are adults. But uh, I think what we need to acknowledge there is that, first of all, uh, there's always been an unfair uh, or the narrative has always been uh, to the disadvantage of young people. Uh, young people have either been seen as lazy or, or too extreme uh, and, and never a nuanced image of them in between. Young people are you know, angry young men taking to the streets or young women are often seen as, as just victims, uh, for example. So I think that narrative is created by uh, non-youth and it, 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 it disadvantages young people largely. So there's a power dynamic there that you can't forget when you talk about the intergenerational dialogue. And I think that places some responsibility at least on, on the non-youth to initiate that intergenerational dialogue. Uh, because placing the responsibility uh, on, on the disadvantaged group, the disprivileged group, group I think will, will only lead to more tension and, and more distrust. So, and, and to that point as well, I think there's, a, uh, there's also, uh, you know, Sometimes we need that tension, oftentimes we need that tension. As in New Zealand, the, the, the reaction from the, uh, the parliamentarian sparked a debate, and unfortunately that debate led to some friction. But I think these are conversations that are needed, and sometimes young people need to hold, hold other generations accountable, and, uh, and sometimes we need to focus on trust building. Yeah. Uh, and I think young people do both yeah. uh, at the same time. Oftentimes. And also I think this, this stereotype about young people are always supposed to bring the solutions and also if you're in a room full of decision makers and if you're the young person in the room, you're always expected to say something radical or expected to say something interesting. You're not really recognized as the expert you are. So for an example, in a very recent um, conversation around climate change, we facilitated the participation of a group of young, young uh, 
entrepreneurs and young scientists with a group of um, policymakers, particularly on climate change. And there was this the, the, the same argument about, oh, but the young people in the room, they were talking about the same things that, that the IPCC report was saying, that the Paris Agreement was saying. They didn't bring anything new. Like, we're not here to bring anything new. We are here to make sure that you are actually implementing the commitments yeah. that you made yeah. in the Paris Agreement. The solutions are already there. The solutions is not subsidizing fossil fuels. The solutions is taxing carbon, not people. We just want you to implement them, you know? So, so I think it, this, is, this is a very interesting conversation about also breaking those myths and misconceptions about sometimes other the expectations from young people. Um, let me go back to the audience again. I have time to take another round of three questions, and we then wrap up with the answers. I'll come back to you, Hab. One here, one question at the back. Now no one's from this side raising their hands. So we have two questions uh, or comments. Do you mind? I already... <laughs> Philippe, you will get your chance to speak. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Anoshka. I'm here with a, from a project that brings together youth from Canada and Europe. Um, IFM, SCI, Ellen's organization is part of this. And I want to address one point that is really um, prevalent for many of our youth. We are small organizations, but we have immense impact. We work with limited funds, but we change lives every day. And it's really hurtful for some of us to feel like, oh, you're small, you don't have much money, so you don't count. So I really want to, to raise the voice of small organizations here and to say our work is super valuable as well, and we also need to be acknowledged. And I think it's a great opportunity for us to have Ellen on this stage, but I also want to make it more visible that small organizations have incredible impact and have incredible work and I think we should value that. Hello, uh, my name is Calum, I'm from uh, Scout in Ireland and I'd just like to thank the amazing panel here today because it's been a very interesting to get all the different perspectives of all the different organisations. So um, yesterday we spoke a lot about um, how non-formal education and formal education complement each other and link to each other and today we've looked at how companies and wider society link in. So I suppose my, my question for the panel is how do we take partnerships and uh, links that we have made in societies uh, and use these effectively to challenge the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have a microphone here? Two or three, in the fourth row. Hi, my name is Monica. I'm from Polish Scouting. And my question is about um, the heroes we saw, I would say even before as an example. So we are talking about young people and putting responsibility on them. But what about organizations? Why we needed Greta to stand up for climate change? Why did it not one of our organizations that we are represented here? We have over 60 organizations and we needed young people to do that. So. My question is, is the responsibility of the organization to put up young people into the front and give them the, again, responsibility to do it? Or is it our responsibility as a whole group? Because we don't need like only young heroes, we can do it as well as a whole group and work on that. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to encourage them to have like that power. Thank you. Felipe, I think we have time for you. <laughs> you don't need to have mic. You have one. Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, I mean, amazing to have such a young and inspiring panel. So thank you very much for being here and being examples and, and an inspiration for all of us. Now, we also spoke a, a lot about intergeneration and Julio said something really interesting, which is most of these young people are adults. And, and that's the thing, of course, age is one indicator of adulthood. Another one is to the degree to which you take responsibility and accountability to yourself and the world around you. Now, I want you to tap not only on your knowledge, and you're clearly very, very knowledgeable, I want you to also tap on your wisdom, which is something that I think young people are often underestimated for. So I would like to ask any of you to say, why, what motivated you to take accountability for the world around you and take action to drive change? And also, is there anything that you know now that you wish you knew at the beginning of your journey? 
Thank you very much. I think that will be a very nice wrap up to, to this, question, uh, this panel as well. So I encourage you to respond to the, to the questions um, that was raised earlier. But Philippe's question, I'll take it as the wrap up question that e each and every one of you can answer. OK, I'm going to the question uh, on how we can do like partnership to achieve our uh, SDGs. Like in level, for example, when we work on education, we did a partnership with an online education platform. We're able ask to access a whole platform for young Syrian to have online higher education. Mm -hmm. With this partnership, we achieved the number of 30,000 students able to access this platform. Many of those students have received a job after educating himself and having different courses and certificate from this platform. Other thing yes, as well as... Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> sorry. As well, in other part about partnership, when we speak about goal number 16, when we are cooperating with you, for example, about to be able to participate in the peace process, we try here to, to, uh, to do this participation with the partnership of you about how we can really be part of this process. Like SDGs, uh, it's for us like a strategic goal to achieve. This how we need to work. How does our level of work need, need to be as young people? Thank you. Um, I just want to take on Monica's question about um, a whole collective group, and I really liked the idea that she mentioned. You know, um, we're not just subjecting adults, and we're not just you know we, we're trying to make a a together group effort, and we both have equal responsibilities in this. So I really do hope that you know, after this conference, and not just, uh, not after, but today, from today, that we start thinking about it together, because this is our planet. It isn't your planet, it isn't my planet, it isn't my country, your country. We all share the same space, so we all need to take care of it, and I hope we do work together, young people, adults, all alike, across the globe, to make an impact. So, yeah. Would you? What? Yeah, where to start? Uh, I mean, this has just been such an exhausting and, and very important conversation, I think. Uh, to the point about uh, partnerships for the SDGs, I think uh, there, there's a time for partnership and there's a time for accountability. And, and uh, right now is definitely the time for both. Uh, I think we need to choose wisely when we, when we want to uh, partner with and get closer to and have dinner with and build these relationships and trust with actors and when we should actually be standing outside and telling them to, uh, to get their stuff together. Uh, and, um, and, and young people are doing both and I think we need to be very careful to, uh, to uh, make visible both these contributions. Mm -hmm. And I think that also feeds into the point about uh, what's the role of, uh, of, large, of organizations. And I think there's a, a difficult and, and dangerous trend of the individualization of uh, these types of engagements of uh, individuals such as Greta, you know, and, and, and many others. Uh, and we, we have a huge role to play in countering that narrative, which is driven also by digital media and, and you know, building, building your personal brand. But let's be very careful with, with falling into the trap of, uh, of, of that narrative. Um, yeah. Ellen, what do you think of the question on putting the responsibility on young people? Is it fair? to put the responsibility on young people without providing those spaces, safe spaces, resources, and tools and the empowerment that they need? Actually, I think it's not fair at all. Because you cage someone, and then you ask them to walk out of the cage. That is like really terrible. And uh, young people do not need to like feel all these burdens on our shoulders. And with Greta, I think, well, I, I don't know exactly what to say about that. But I also think that, in a way, it's also good that somebody stood up to, to actually start a conversation that Otherwise, everybody must have started all together. So at this stage, I agree with you that all of us from now should start working together because it's our planet, it's our world. So we each have to like, um, we each have to take our own responsibilities in our own way in whatever things that we can do to make sure that we achieve the change we want in the planet that we want. So that it doesn't have to be the responsibility of Greta alone or any other young person alone, but a collective responsibility of all of us, adults, children, uh, children young people, everyone. Yeah. 
And I think it also challenges the notion that representation should always come from an organization or from a movement, right? There are so many young people who refuse to be a part of organized movement. There are young people who refuse to be, be part of organizations. And it's OK, and it's their right. But I think, as Julius very correctly said, it is about making sure that all voices are represented and, and, and not, of, not of one. Ezekiel, you had something to say? Yeah, no, just answering your question. Uh, I really believe that everybody has a mission here, you know. Um, we have, everyone here has your personal challenges, etc. But when we are together, it's more easy to understand our purpose as families, as a group, etc. As a world, I could say. So our challenge is to find our place on this huge family, I could say. And it's pretty interesting when we can find people that are trying to give their lives not for only to them but to the environment around them you know so <coughs> it's from my point of view for example i am dedicating my life like last nine years to save water i have water i don't need to save water for myself you know <laughs> so the point is <laughs> uh, how to find my right place in this world that i can do something that can create some noise some um, you know that can make a little difference but can make something you know so my point of view is everybody is have a mission the challenge that you have is to find your your mission your mission and i wish to know when i started that we live in a capitalist world so okay. <laughs> the, 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 the challenge is to make money and have money to create more impact you know yeah. for example we work with huge companies our clients here in brazil they have like 20,000 employees or something like this and if i could say to them hey you are saving million liters of water every day or something if we don't show them they are saving money they don't care about the solution so that's why i think that we need to understand that we need to have money to create the change to impact to improve the education to make people have access to different opportunities, you know, and I think that the biggest challenge, just to conclude my, my speech, <laughs> is I think that the biggest challenge that we have is to show to young people that they have many, many opportunities to do something, you know, because <coughs> when I, I, ha I have been in South Africa last year and I was driving like a lot <laughs> and I, I saw a lot of young people, a lot of kids surround the streets, etc. and I was thinking, how this kid could think about Harvard? You know, it's, it's so far the world from one to other that our challenge is to make, uh, to create opportunities to them to show that it's possible to do something more, okay. you know? Thank you very much. Thank you, Eskia. Yeah. And I'm going to wrap up this panel, but I think in order to contextualize everything you have been saying and I think everyone in the audience will agree that you are, you are full of knowledge and you're full of um, sort of you have opinions and very strong opinions on some of these issues. You're leading movements, so you have leadership skills. You're advocates. You advocate very well for the causes that you're standing for. So how did non-formal education shape your journeys and are, is shaping your journeys right now? Just to, as a word of inspiration from each, every one of you, uh, in two lines, just, uh, just tell us how it has shaped your leadership and shaped your work. And then with that, we wrap up this panel discussion you want to get this well uh, wow well, <laughs> uh, it's everything I mean um, I uh, it's a <laughs> it's a cost me to not uh, not uh, get my degree done <laughs> so I have no not not a lot of formal education <laughs> unfortunately but one thing that I realize now that I think I I potentially realized uh, when I went into not you know the started this journey if you will was that be very aware of your your privilege I think and uh, uh, and uh, the you know uh, um, I've managed to to navigate uh, and and be able to be very privileged in my roles, and and that's led to to yet another opportunity. And and uh, if you are such a, a privileged person, make sure that you bring other people with you. Awesome. Exactly, me too. It's open for me many doors where I'm can able to support other young people living in Syria, where I have the chance I'm living in Germany, open to many opportunity to bring it back with the, the non formal education I get. It's. Uh, still inspiring me to learn something new, it gives me more opportunities. About the non-formal education, my point of view is awesome because uh, we can provide the practical uh, information. You know, it's not only theory or something, just papers. You need to do something, you need to act. So that's why non-formal education for me is so important. Like entrepreneur, you need to do something. 
Karine. Um, for me, I believe it's made a major impact in my life because um, coming from a very small island of Trinidad and Tobago, I would have never been been able to fantasize that I would have been able to represent them on such a platform. And um, you know, non-formal education should be greatly um, advocated and encouraged because it teaches young people and older folks as well about basic life skills, you know, about values, about things that you're passionate about, and, you know, it adds a sense of purpose to your life. So it's really important that we continue these awesome ventures. Okay, so for me, non-formal education has taught me not to just consume what the world gives me, but to also analyze critically my role and what to give back to the earth, the planet, for all that it has given me. So this for me is very important, and that is why non-formal education should really be encouraged. Thank you very much. Please give a warm round of applause. To our <laughs>